Thank you very much to uh, Language Cert for inviting me to do a, a, a keynote today. It's an honor and a, a privilege. I'd like to thank Sylvia and um, Christina, Mariana, and Paul for their for their help in in in, in getting me here today and working with the technology. And uh, welcome to, uh, to 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 everyone who's attending the session. Thank you very much for attending the session. And I'm um, uh, I'm speaking from uh, my home in Barcelona, Spain. It's about 10 o'clock in the morning here. And uh, if you know Barcelona, I'm about three blocks from the Sagrada Familia, perhaps the best known sort of monument in uh, uh, in Barcelona. So just to give you a little bit, uh, an idea of uh, my, my, uh, my context here. Um, so what I'm going to be doing today, I'm going to be talking about empathy uh, in, in language teaching, and it relates uh, in many ways to uh, what, what Jane spoke about in her, in her excellent session. So there's some crossover uh, there. Uh, and I'm going to be re relating empathy to the concept um, of, of care, and perhaps in some ways, empathy is a prerequisite to, to, to care. And um, um, before I actually start the main part of my talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you some things um, about myself, um, uh, some events in my life and my career, uh, which are related in some way to empathy, and re then refer back to them in the main part of my the main part of my uh, the main part of my talk. So I was I was born in in Birmingham in England, and my my parents were both uh, Irish immigrants, and they they moved to England because there were no jobs or opportunities for them in Ireland. Uh, and then they met in Birmingham. They got married. They had six children, and uh, my my brothers and sisters and I we 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 grew up in a in a multicultural working class area of Birmingham with a large close knit Irish community, and our our childhood was 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 very happy. But when I was two, I had a serious uh, kidney disorder and I was hospitalized on, on a number of occasions for many months. And when I came out of hospital, uh, I seemed to be traumatized by the experience and, and I was afraid uh, of many things. And I had a stammer and I continued to have problems with my kidneys and the, do the, the doctors wanted me to have a, a colostomy bag. Uh, and when I was I started primary school, when I was five, one day after school, uh, my my teacher, Miss Miss Askew, took my mother and myself to the cloakroom, and she said to me, "Do it, Kieran." And I sang the lullaby, "Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star." And I imagine many of you know the lullaby, "Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star." How I wonder what you are. Um, Miss Askew taught me this, and I sang it without stammering. So my mother was amazed, and she was uh, in floods of tears. So Miss Askew had spent her her breaks and her lunch times uh, teaching me the lullaby, and this helped me to overcome uh, my my stammer. Um, and uh, both my stammer and and kidney problem eventually disappeared. I went to secondary school. After secondary school, I went to university and then went on to do my initial teacher training. And one of the first uh, jobs that I had was at a college in Birmingham where I was able to teach uh, fascinating students from around the world who needed English to work on projects uh, abroad for their NGOs. And in the staff room at the, at the college, I discovered Jill Hatfield's resource book, Classroom Dynamics, which had lots of interesting humanistic uh, techniques, and many of which focused uh, on, on empathy. And I all, also discovered the work of um, uh, Carl Rogers and El Stevick's book, Teaching Languages Away and Ways, where I, where I read his famous dictum, which Jane referred to. Uh, as well in in her excellent talk. So many of you will already know this this dictum, this quote, and um, many of you will not. So I'll just I'll just give you that. Uh, I'll put it there for a moment for you to see to see that. Um, and and this this dictum had a strong influence on my teaching throughout my career. And I always thought it related in some way to uh, to, to to empathy. Um, Subsequently, I was lucky enough to live and work in a number of countries and uh, learn a number of languages. Um, and language teaching has been very kind to me. I've met hundreds of wonderful teachers, taught, taught thousands of lovely, enthusiastic students. However, at, at a few points uh, in my career, uh, I, I, I've considered leaving the profession because of the long hours, the low pay and general precarity. 
um, when I was working really long hours, there were times I would become I would become frustrated at myself for not being as patient or empathic to students as I knew I could be. Uh, but I persevered and I taught full time for almost 30 years and the last 12 years of which were, t were, were spent teaching older students aged from 65 to 85. So um, I, I feel fortunate to, to have uh, chosen teaching as a career. So these experiences, which I, I've just explained, uh, have all contributed to my interest in empathy, and I'm going to refer back to them uh, during my uh, during my my talk. Um, and here we have an overview of the session. So what what we're going to do? We're going to look first of all. I'm just going to define empathy. Um, look at its various components. We're then going to look very briefly at the neurological foundations of empathy and then why empathy is important in society, in education in general, language education in particular. Then we're going to look at the characteristics of an empathic uh, uh, teacher. We're going to explore if there is an empathy deficit in language education. And in the last part of the session, we're going to look at uh, practical activities uh, which can foster empathy uh, in the classroom. Okay, so the, would, first of all, we, 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 I think we need, obviously we need to define uh, empathy um, and empathy is a complex construct um, uh, which has a number of, of components. And I'm going to use uh, Roman Krisnarik's definition, which I think is particularly uh, nuanced and and recognizes the multiple components of empathy. So you have the uh, the definition here. <clears throat> so uh, Krisnarik's uh, definition uh, recognizes three components of empathy, and the first is a cognitive part. So that's the the recognition or understanding part, stepping imaginatively into the shoes of another person. So the cognitive part is the drive to identify what another person might be thinking or feeling. So it's about putting yourself in somebody else's shoes and imagining what's going on in their mind. So the cognitive component is about perspective taking. The second uh, component um, is effective, understanding their feelings and perspectives. Um, so it's the emotional reaction to somebody else's thoughts and feelings. So the effective component is about shared emotional response. Both the cognitive component and the effective component must be combined to create the third component, uh, empathic concern, using that understanding to guide your action. So empathic concern is is an emotional response of compassion and concern that leads us to care about the other person's welfare and to want to take action to help them if they're in need. So empathic concern involves the will for action, the will to do something for the other person. Cognitive and effective empathy alone are not enough for pro-social behaviors. Parent-child attachment uh, is key in the formation of, of empathy. So children um, must have experienced empathic and caring treatment themselves if they're in turn to develop empathy. And children who haven't been nurtured and experienced empathic and caring behaviour are more likely to develop into less morally aware adults. Um, Carl Rogers argued that experience but not brilliance improves empathy. So Rogers believed that empathy can potentially be developed by training. That, and there's an overwhelming consensus among experts that we can develop our empathic potential throughout our lives. So we don't have a fixed empathy quota. We can develop and, and grow our empathy, which is, which is good news. So 
having defined empathy and looked at its various components, we now need to explore the neurological foundations of empathy. And to do this, we'll look at two moments of scientific uh, serendipity. The first moment of scientific serendipity is related to this man here, uh, Phineas Gage, who was a railway foreman in the USA in the 19th century. And he used a metal rod, which you can see in the illustration, to push, push dynamite down to create uh, explosions before he and his labourers laid uh, the railway track. But one day the dynamite went off early and it, it, it blew the pole right up underneath uh, Gage's uh, eye and through his brain, as you can see in the illustration. And quite incredibly, uh, Gage survived the accident. Now, before the accident, he was described as a courteous, polite and considerate person. But after the accident, he was described as impulsive and rude. And he seemed to be unable to judge what was socially uh, appropriate. His memory and his language weren't affected by the brain damage, but his empathy seemed to have been. And then uh, more than 100 years later, the Portuguese neuroscientist ha ha Hannah Damasio, who uh, is the wife of Antonio Damasio, who, who Jane referred to in her, in her talk, was able to uh, obtain Gage's uh, brain, which had been preserved in, in, in a vat. Uh, and she put it into an MRI scanner to see exactly where the location of the damage was. And she discovered that it was in the left ventral medial prefrontal cortex, as you can see uh, in the in illustration there. So the involvement of the left ventral medial prefrontal cortex in empathy is now well confirmed by neuroscience, but it's not the only region involved in empathy. Uh, now we're going to turn to the second um, case of scientific serendipity. And this was in 1990 when Giacomo Rizzolatti of the University of Parma in Italy accidentally discovered mirror neurons while conducting experiments on the, uh, in the F5 brain region of monkeys. And he recorded that a particular region of the premotor cortex was activated when uh, a, a monkey picked up uh, a peanut, as you can see in the illustration, but then completely, uh, completely by accident, uh, he noticed that the same region lit up when the monkey happened to see a researcher pick up a nut, even though the monkey hadn't moved an inch. So the brain had responded as if the brain had grasped the nut itself. And that subsequent brain imaging uh, experiments have shown that the inferior frontal cortex and the superior parietal uh, lobe are active when the person performs an action and also when the person sees another person perform an action. And it's been suggested that th th these brain regions contain mirror neurons, and many of you will have heard of, 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 of mirror neurons. Um, however, um, mirror neurons are just the beginning of the, uh, the empathic brain. It's important to understand there's no simple empathy center in the brain. Mirror neurons are just part of a much more complex empathy circuit comprising 14 different but inter interconnected brain regions, which you can see uh, in the illustration here. So when we empathize with another person, this network of regions is activated. And I think that these neurological insights remind us what an extraordinary and complex capacity uh, empathy is. Um, we now need to turn, turn to why empathy is important in society. Uh, in his book, The Empathic Civilization, economic and social theorist Jeremy Rifkin argues that empathy is the universal human trait that holds society together. Empathy is also vital for a healthy democracy. Um, it ensures we listen to different perspectives and that we hear and feel uh, other uh, people's emotions. Um, um, and and David David Howe of the U the University of 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 East Anglia uh, is talking about how democracy is diminished here. And and I think that in many parts of the world we're seeing this that when empathy declines, that there there is uh, it erodes democracy. 
in some in some way. Now, what I'd just like to do now, just 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 for a moment, I'd like to just go over to you. Uh, the research shows that at least in the West, but experts believe that also in many in in other parts of the world, um, empathy has declined. Would you like to put into the uh, the, the 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 chat function? Um, why do you think empathy has declined in society? Are there any reasons that you can think of as to why uh, empathy uh, has declined in in society? In, in in certainly in the in 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 the re, in recent uh, in recent decades. A focus uh, that I see a focus on on competition, lack of empathic education from Irene. Yes. Uh, industrialization, selfishness from uh, Mohammed there, uh, selfishness, careless society, fear, individualism. These are all fantastic answers. Um, greed, uh, the shift in societal values, the ego, self-centered. All of these are wonderful things. I lots of community spirits. Absolutely fantastic answers. I wish I had time to go through all of them there, but those are excellent answers and very much connected uh, to uh to um to what i'm going to say uh what i'm going to say now so thank you thank you very much for for, for answering there so um empathy has in, has indeed uh declined uh we looked at before that empathy was vital in society so its rapid decline uh is is alarming and barack obama referred to this as, as the empathy deficit in society um, a study by Conrad O'Brien and a singer at the University of Michigan in 2010 revealed a dramatic decline in empathy levels among college students between 1980 and 2010, with the steepest drop being after the year 2000. So college students in the US uh, today demonstrated about 40% less empathy than their counterparts of 20 or 30 years ago, which is truly alarming. And these researchers think a number of factors may be responsible for this empathy deficit. The first one was uh, more people spending, uh, sorry, more people living alone and spending less time engaged in social and community activities, which nurture empathy. The increased use of uh, uh, of technology and the rise of social media was another factor. And another factor which, which many of you mentioned in, in the chat was a hyper-competitive social environment and inflated expectations of success. Um, uh, now we'll just turn to why empathy is important uh, in, in education. So in recent years, educators have increasingly expressed the importance of emotion and the development of empathy as part of moral development education. And Daniel Goldman, the author of the best-selling book, Emotional Intelligence, argues that emotional intelligence goes hand, hand in hand with moral development, which you can see from the quote here. Research shows that in all educational settings, high quality relationships between the teacher and learner and among learners are essential for learning. And empathy is essential in creating these quality caring relationships and would appear to be central to all successful learning and, and development. Um, the, the child, Child advocate Mary Gordon, I think, captures the centrality of empathy and the high quality relationships we form with our learners when she writes to teach children we must first reach them. Um, and and I, I think we reach children by empathizing for and caring for our students. In my in my introduction, I mentioned my primary school teacher, Miss Askew, who, who found the time to teach me how to sing the lullaby, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, help me overcome my speech impediment. And I think in this case, Miss Askew had to reach me first before she could teach me. So um, having looked at why empathy is essential um, in, in education, we now need to explore the characteristics of empathic teachers. 
And I'm going to refer specifically to the characteristics of teacher empathy proposed by Bridget Cooper of the University of Sunderland in the UK. And according to, to, to Bridget Cooper, the characteristics of teacher empathy fall into pro, uh, three broad areas. There's functional empathy, fundamental empathy, and profound empathy. And we're going to explore each of these categories uh, in, in turn, briefly explore them in, 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 in turn. So um, first of all, we'll look at uh, funct functional uh, empathy. So functional empathy is, uh, is demonstrated when teachers create a mental model of a, a whole group of students and functional empathy can be divided into three categories. Um, the first is a group empathy and whole class relationships. So to use functional empathy, teachers need to have a rich social, emotional and academic understanding of a whole group of students. Uh, the second category are uh, uh, fair uh, rules, fairness and manners. So, so um, this is the establishment of fair and reasonable group rules and good manners between the teacher and and students and the third category is while using functional empathy teachers often categorize students into different types and groups in order to assess them and to cater for their needs um, there are a number of conclusions that we can draw about functional empathy. Functional empathy is absolutely essential in the classroom. It provides cohesion and security. It creates understanding and a positive uh, group climate. However, a teacher who only uses functional em empathy doesn't cater to the needs of individual students who don't conform to the group stereotype. <clears throat> so, most teachers try to supplement this functional empathy with fundamental empathy and profound empathy for in individual students. Uh, so now we'll look at uh, fundamental empathy. So fundamental empathy um, is, is, is needed to initiate empathic relation, relationships, and it can be observed, observed in the type of social interactions that most people use to engage in conversations and relationships with, with others in daily life. And it can be divided into two main, uh, two main areas, the initial characteristics and the means of communication. First of all, we'll look at the initial uh, characteristics. Um, and the first acceptance and openness is a vital starting point in empathic relationships. So teachers accept students as they find them. And by being open themselves and sharing their own experiences, teachers eventually learn more about students. Focus sole attention between the teacher and students maximizes engagement, communication and learning. Um, and listening, which is which is something that Jane referred to, empathic teachers listen and value individual students by hearing their perspective and showing they 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 care. Um, and showing interest makes the student feel valued and and worthy. And empathic teachers directly praise students, and direct praise is particularly important for students from minority groups. Uh, and, and students with special educational needs or specific learning difficulties who may receive little praise elsewhere in the educational uh, system. So this is very much the confirming behavior which Jane referred to in her, in her talk. And finally, uh, empathic teachers are enthusiastic about both their subject and their relationship with students. Now, the, the, the empathic attitudes that I've just described uh, need to be clearly communicated or they wouldn't have any any effect. So classroom teachers commonly emphasize their facial and and bodily expressions. And we're just going to uh, explore this. So teachers who practice fundamental empathy are aware of the importance of clear facial expression. And eye contact is especially significant as it leads to immediate and meaningful communication. And using eye contact as a means of communication is much easier in face-to-face -face classes than it is in online classes. Uh, teachers also watch their, their students' facial expressions carefully to gauge response and understanding. And again, 
gauging students' facial expression as a means of communication is much easier in face-to-face -face classes. Um, and teachers who practice fundamental empathy are aware of the importance of gesture, body language, and movement. And again, reading gesture and body language is much easier in face-to-face -face classes than it is in online classes. Uh, teachers who practice fundamental empathy build relationships and learning improve when they can get closer to students. So physical closeness produces emotional closeness and promotes caring and sharing. And this physical closeness is obviously only possible in face to face classes. And, and uh, another characteristic is that em uh, empathic teachers use appropriate language which doesn't mystify or confuse students. They're aware of the importance of voice tone. And, and for example, they mirror quiet students by speaking gently and, and, and thoughtfully. Um, there are a number of conclusions that we can draw about fundamental empathy. Um, fundamental empathy um, initiates the, the, the focused interactive relationships that support engagement, interaction, uh, interaction and learning. And the active listening and interest of the empathic teacher begins this engagement with the other person, which over time can, de can develop into emotional it attachment. And the enthusiasm of these teachers begins to engage students at an emotional level uh, in learning. And now we'll turn to, uh, to profound empathy. And, and Bridget Cooper contends that profound empathy is of a higher order than functional empathy or fundamental empathy, as its characteristics show deeper and broader levels of understanding, which are associated with closer and longer lasting relationships. So what are the um, what are the characteristics of profoundly empathic teachers Bridget Cooper discovered in her research? Well, we're going to explore these now. So um, firstly, profoundly empathic teachers uh, act to create positive emotions. They realize that positive personal interaction needs soul attention, attention and individual quality time. And they make time for interaction with students before and after class in breaks and lunchtime and after school. In my in my introduction, I mentioned my primary school teacher, Miss Askew, who taught me the lullaby to help me overcome my speech in speech impediment while teaching 30 other students. So Miss Askew is an example of a time giver who gave soul attention. And I think throughout the pandemic, teachers showed that they are time givers, the amount of time they dedicated to students and their family and the welfare of students and their families. Um, profoundly empathic teachers are, are aware of the importance of knowing themselves and trying to get inside their students thinking and feeling. So these teachers remember their own reactions and their and their own children's reactions to teachers. So when I was teaching children, I'd often think about how my primary school teachers treated me or ask myself how I would like a teacher to treat my own children. And this guided my actions. When I taught older uh, adult learners, I would think how I'd like uh, a teacher to treat my own 92-year-old mother. This guy did my actions, and I'm sure uh, most of you do, do the same or something very similar. Um, profoundly empathic teachers uh, lay great stress on the importance of relationships in teaching and learning, and they feel high quality relationships set secure boundaries, enable good communication and and interaction. And um, profoundly empathic teachers empathize deeply with a wide range of students and they build up an encyclopedic knowledge of all students. Profoundly empathic teachers also take responsibility for the well-being uh, of students, for the care of students, as well as their academic performance. And profoundly empathic teachers are highly adaptive and they're aware of the different roles they adopt with different students. And they build an ex uh, extremely rich mental model of their students and develop 
deep attachments with their students. Uh, and finally, uh, profoundly empathic teachers try to be good people to do the right thing and to support and care for others. And, 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 and the moral behavior of the teacher is naturally mirrored by students. And I think this moral aspect of profound empathy was shown by teachers throughout the pandemic when they were compassionate and generous to students and, and, their, and their families. Um, there are a number of conclusions that we can draw uh, about uh, profound empathy. Um, profoundly empathic teachers are considered unselfish, caring, kind and pleasant. The empathic and caring behaviour of these teachers engenders similar behaviour in their students. And profound empathy helps to produce what Bridget Cooper calls the constant human dialogue necessary for learning to take place. And I love this, this, this phrase, the constant human dialogue necessary for learning to take place. Um, when we look at the literature, um, profound teacher empathy reminds us of Carl Rogers' um, synonym for empathy, sensitive understanding, and his concept of unconditional positive regard for the other. It also reminds us of Earl Stivik's presence of harmony in the classroom, which I referred to in my introduction and Jane referred to uh, in her talk. And uh, profound empathy, soul attention, and deep attachment resemble Nell Nodding's engrossment and Sylvia uh, in her introduction uh, to the webinars today, refer to uh, now nodding. It also is uh, resemble I, uh, Iris Murdoch's loving attention that promotes moral uh, moral development. Okay. Um, now we need to explore why empathy is particularly important in language education. And what I'm going to do again, I'm just going to hand this over to you just for a minute. Um, why do you think empathy might be particularly important in language education? What we've said that in general education, empathy is is very important. But I would argue and and researchers argue that um, empathy is particularly important in language education. Um, would you like to, in the chat, would you like to uh, put any ideas that you that you have there? Emotional filters di disappear, relieve the, the stress of exposure. Okay, great. Uh, morality, okay, fantastic. Okay, it's about communication. It builds confidence, uh, incentive to interact. Okay, fantastic. And to open authentic communication. Empathy helps us to be patient, respect each person's uh, learning rhythms. Fantastic. I love all of the answers here. Again, I haven't got time to go through all of them, but I would very much like to do so. And your answers are very much uh in line with research with research findings there so thank you for for for, for participating in, in that chat there um so um so as i said as we've already seen empathy high quality relationships are central to all successful learning and development and however as i mentioned before contemporary language classrooms where communicative competence is a central goal and which use communicative language teaching and learned centered approaches, which are highly social and interpersonal in nature, high quality relationships are particularly important. Um, in 2016, Christina Gnu and Sarah Mercer carried out the first large scale study on the uh, emotional and social intelligence of English language teachers across the, 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 the globe. And the results of the quantitative survey revealed that English language teachers generally scored highly on the emotional and social intelligence scales. 
One possible reason for the high scores could be that most language teachers are bilingual, trilingual, or, or polyglots. And research shows that bilinguals have higher levels of empathy than monolinguals, and empathy is a key component of social and emotional intelligence. I mentioned in, in my introduction that uh, teaching has allowed me to learn a number of languages, and I feel this has increased my empathy. And I'm sure many of you also feel learning a language has helped you to develop uh, your empathy. Uh, Ganu and Mercer's qualitative research findings show that the majority of teachers emphasize the importance of uh, having meaningful, high quality relationships with their students and, port and, and pointed to four main characteristics of these, of these quality relationships, respect, trust, responsiveness and empathy. And empathy was the most mentioned characteristic of meaningful, high quality relationships with students. All of the teachers directly or indirectly mentioned empathy over uh, 1,500 teachers. Um, so the, the key to achieving these meaningful, high quality relationships with uh, our students and other teachers is our capacity to, 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 to empathize. And Given the increasingly uh, multicultural and multilingual nature um, of the language classroom in many parts of the world, language teachers and learners need to develop intercultural skills and empathy has a vital role to play in, to, in promoting intercultural competence, which is a key facet of communicative competence. And, and as, as uh, um, Sarah and Christina argue here, nurturing empathy can increase learners' awareness, understanding and appreciation of, of other cultures. And as Bridget Cooper argues here, empathy is even more important in the ESL classroom where students often feel inadequate as they've gone from feeling confident and competent in classrooms in their own countries to classrooms in a foreign country where communication may be very difficult or even in, impossible. Um, and to boost the self-confidence and self-esteem of ESL students, the teacher needs a huge amount of sensitivity and empathy. So uh, in sum, as Sarah Mercer uh, contends, um, empathy is particularly important in language education because of its focus on communication, social interactions, and, and cultural diversity. Now, we're just going to um, look at if there is a deficit, an empathy deficit in language education. When we looked at the importance of empathy in society, I refer to what Barack Obama has termed the, the empathy deficit. So we're going to explore if an empathy deficit exists in, in, in our own field. So I think that language teachers are aware of the importance of empathy and successful learning, and they want to be and try to be empathic. And undoubtedly, one of the most effective ways of embedding a culture of empathy in, in language education is for teachers to act as role models of an empathic and moral person. However, there are a number of factors which may hinder teachers' abilities to be empathic and caring and for us to embed a culture of empathy. Now, you'll probably already be aware of these factors, but perhaps it's the first time you've heard them related to the construct of empathy. So what are these hindering, uh, these hindering factors? Now, one hindering factor is the exclusion of certain groups of people from course books. Many of you will already know the PARSNIPS acronym, which stands for just a few of the many taboo subjects in ELT course books. And you have the, the acronym there. Now, the reasons the reason publishers censor material is that they want to sell books in as many markets as possible, and they don't want to upset local sensibilities. However, I'd argue that the PARSNIPS approach is, is fundamentally flawed. Um, as Amir Garmoudi contends here, it, it's based on a one-size-fits-all method of content creation. It's certainly economic, but it's not necessarily ethical But it ex because it excludes and others, many people, as it denies their experiences, their life choices, 
their belief systems and may make it more difficult for students to empathize with these uh, people. And, and I believe that all of us, teachers, teachers, trainers, managers, writers, publishers need to be braver and to push for more inclusivity in ELT materials. Now, a recent initiative to make ELT course books more inclusive is raised up by Ila Quimbra and James Taylor, which is a course book which represents groups of people such as working class people, homosexuals, indigenous people, refugees, the elderly and disabled, who've traditionally been excluded from uh, course books. Um, during my, my, my career, many of the very best teachers I met have been non-native English speaking teachers. However, there's still widespread uh, <clears throat> Sorry, uh, I, I'm sorry there. And sorry, just another hindering factor is native speakerism, uh, which uh, Savannah Richardson spoke about eloquently and passionately in her seminar Ayatepo Plenary in Birmingham in 2016. Uh, during my career, many of the very best teachers I've met have been non-native English speaking teachers. However, there's still widespread discrimination in recruitment and conditions of this group of teachers. And I think there has to be equity for, for native and non-native teachers uh, of, of, of English. And uh, TEFL Equity Advocates is an organization set up by Marek Kishovek, which fights to achieve this equity. So as, as Marek argues, both native and non-native speakers can be equally good teachers. And I think that those of us in the profession who are, who are native speakers of English should imagine what it feels like to be a person who's learned English to a high level, studied pedagogy at university, pursued professional development, and then to be rejected for a job or receive a worse salary and conditions because their native language is not, uh, is not English. Um, a general hindering factor is the undervaluing of teachers, which, which Paolo Revoyedo referred to in her excellent IATEPO plenary on teacher empowerment in Liverpool in 2019. Um, teachers feel undervalued. Uh, teacher morale is a major problem. In the UK, 50% of teachers leave the profession uh, within the first five years of service. So if, if a child must feel valued to value others and must experience empathy themselves to de demonstrate empathy to others, as Carl Rogers argued, there's also the implication that teachers need to feel valued in order to transmit values and empathy and a caring attitude to their, to their students. Uh, one of the reasons teachers feel undervalued are the long hours and low pay and precarity that many teachers endure. We know that if workers are overworked, stressed and tired, this has a negative impact on their capacity to empathise. In many countries, language teachers in the private sector often have several employers, limited job security, sick pay and holiday pay and low hourly rates. Uh, in the public sector, pay and conditions for teachers are getting worse with entrenched underfunding and a move towards private privatization. <clears throat> so the solution certainly involves teachers becoming members of local unions or forming one if one doesn't already exist in order to try to protect and improve their, their, their rights and pay and to fight for compensation when schools close, as you can see teachers in Dublin, London and Barcelona uh, are doing here. But perhaps it also involves teachers organizing themselves collectively, as Philip Kerr and Ang, uh, Andrew Wickham suggest here. Now, an example of collective organization is Co Cooperativa Cerveis Linguistics de Barcelona, a cooperative set up by teachers in Barcelona who offer language classes, teacher training courses, translations, and services for language uh, teachers. And um, and another uh, uh, factor that may make it challenging to embed a culture of empathy in language teaching is the poor mental health of, of many language teachers. Research shows um, uh, that people who have poor mental health may find it more difficult to empathize with, with, with other people. Um, in a 2020 UK study by the charity Education Support, 31% uh, of teachers said that they'd experienced a mental health problem in the past year. 84% of teachers um, described themselves as stressed or very stressed, and 74% of teachers have considered leaving uh, leaving the profession due to pressures on their health and well-being. And I, I feel that language teachers may be even more susceptible to poor mental health because of the poor working conditions we, explore, we explored earlier. 
Uh, Phil Longwell is a teacher I admire very much for his bravery, honesty and openness about his mental health issues. In 2017, Phil carried out research into the causes of and possible solutions to poor uh, mental health in English language teaching. Uh, in the qualitative part of his studies, teachers wrote about their experiences of poor mental health in the in the in the staff room and classroom. And here we have two examples, which I'll just give you a moment to read. So both teachers talk about poor working conditions and precarity as causes of poor mental health. I believe schools are at least uh, partly responsible for, for their teachers' well-being and can do a lot to improve it by improving their working conditions. So just moving into the final part of my talk, um, we're now going to explore uh, ways that empathy can be explicitly developed in our classes. Just for the last five minutes, we'll, we'll do this. Now, one way for trainee teachers, teachers and trainers to become more empathic is to keep a reflexive journal, to reflect on the perspective of, col of colleagues and students and to record every time uh, we notice an instance of, of ourselves, uh, a student or, or a colleague being empathic. Reflecting on the diversity of perspectives is important as teachers need to be able to have empathy for, 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 for all our students and, and colleagues, not just those with whom we find it easier to empathize. Now, this technique comes from cognitive behavioral therapy and it helps us realize that empathy is there if we consciously look for it. Um, as, as empathy, um, as empathy is promoted whenever we focus on the human experience, when, when we read a novel, when we act in a play, when we look at a painting or when we watch a film, we're now going to explore how the arts and perspective taking activities can be used to foster empathy among students. And the use of drama and role play is an especially effective method for fostering empathy, given that that role plays is familiar is a familiar type of activity in many communicative language teaching classrooms it's relatively easy to adapt tasks to focus on empathy however we need to give students time to prepare their roles and and get into their character so we have these empathy raising questions here we give these questions to students these questions such as what kind of things do, do, do you think they like and dislike? And what or who do they care or worry about? These questions help students to get into their character by empathizing with, it, with their character. We, we give these questions to students for homework, they get into the character, they come back, they perform their role play. The role play is much more effective, more language is produced and, and students empathize more with their, with their character. Um, as much as fiction focuses on the psychology of characters and their relationship, it helps to extend empathy. So, uh, we should encourage students to read fiction about people who are different from them and people from marginalized groups. So, and after reading a, a, a novel, a short story, a reader, we can uh, ask students to reflect on these empathy raising questions such as, how would you feel if you were that person? And what would you have done differently in that situation which focus on the psychology of the characters? We can also show films about people who are different from our students and about marginalized people. We could get them to watch this short film called Ali's Story, which tells the story of young Afghan boy who has to flee his country because of war and becomes a refugee in Britain. Then we can give students these empathy raising questions such as, how do you think Ali might be feeling? How do you know? And what led Ali to make that choice? Another way of taking somebody else's perspective is to make the imaginative leap into the life of another through the use of art. So showing students a, a painting or a photo such as the one we have here, give them a perspective taking instruction such as, Imagine a day in the life of this individual if you were that as if you were that person looking at the world through her eyes and walking through the world in, in her shoes. And finally, um, a number of visible thinking routines which are developed at Project Zero of the Harvard Graduate School of Education can be used to foster empathy. 
at this routine, step inside, perceive, know about, care about, Uh, ask students to step inside the role of a character from a picture they're looking at, a short film they've watched or a story they've read, and to imagine themselves inside that point of view. Students then speak or write from the chosen point of view. And that you can see the three core questions that guide uh, students in this routine. What can the person perceive? What might the person know about or care about? And what might... Um, what might the person know about or believe? What might the person care about? And then we can use an image such as such as this one here, and students put themselves into the role of one of the characters um, in the image, and they look at the three questions and they write or speak from the perspective of the person there. It's an excellent to try to get students to select a character with somebody who is different, quite different from them, and has a different worldview from them. So uh, just, uh, just to conclude some concluding thoughts, um, I think that language teachers have great commitment to what they do. They work incredibly hard and extremely long hours. If we provided the conditions which, which were conducive to empathy and allowed it to flourish, we'd probably see happier teachers and students and more effective uh, language learning. Um, as, as we're seeing post pandemic education requires huge amounts of empathy, care and compassion. And teachers need the right conditions to provide this empathy, care and compassion. And when the, the, the reimagining of, of education comes in, in past, post pandemic education, we sh let's reimagine how we can optimize language learning, but as an integral part of that, let's also reimagine entrenched underfunding and let's reimagine uh, teachers pay and and conditions and just finally i just like to refer back to uh Earl Stivik's, uh dictum which i referred to in my uh in my introduction i i would say that perhaps empathy is the only thing that that will allow us to, to have to create this empathy in the language classroom um in the language staff room and indeed in the whole uh, language teaching uh, profession. So thank you so much for uh, attending the webinar today. And thank you so much to uh, to Language Cert for inviting me um, to uh, to do the session. It's been it's been a, a privilege.